Well, good evening to everybody. Uh, if you're online with us, it is good to see you. Uh, well, good to be with you uh, tonight. Just excited about uh, sharing a little bit. Uh, and then um, later, I also just got to give you a heads up. Uh, later, after we get done with the study, um, I'm going to save a little bit of time to um, have some special prayer. Um, there's several big, pretty impactful things going on and uh, that are that have happened and stuff, and just want to take some time and and pray, uh, pray for some people and some different things going on in our world. So, uh, all that being said, if you uh, if you have a prayer request, uh, you know, online or whatever, y'all just put them on there. We'll make sure to go and catch comments and uh, take those to the Lord in prayer. But tonight, I'm going to invite you to turn in your Bibles. If you got your Bible, if you got your phone, however you want to do it, get get in your Bibles to Joshua chapter 24. Joshua chapter 24. So. Pretty on, early on in the Bible. If you're getting it on a uh, device, no big deal. Just type in or find Joshua, Joshua chapter 24. And uh, we're going to look at uh, a few verses tonight, verses uh, 13 through, uh, really 13 through 17, but we're going to focus in on 14 and 15 uh, primarily tonight. And I want you to think about worship, um, focused worship. Now, we often think about worship, and I'm not really going to like do a, like bring up worship a ton. But what I'm going to talk about tonight has to do with worship. We think about worship; we automatically think about singing songs, right? That's the first thing that comes to our mind. Uh, we've been conditioned that that is what worship is. But we worship throughout our day. We all we all know this. I'm just bringing these things back up. We worship throughout our day, and. Uh, but but I want to I want to like get in on us a little bit tonight. So tonight, uh, I think it went really well this morning uh, during our ten thirty service. Uh, and and if you're watching online or if you're here, we do have a ten thirty service. It, it is it is an alternative service that if somebody can make it, have a good time. We have worship there. We have uh, this the message that's on Wednesday night there. Um, but some folks may feel more comfortable coming during that time. Uh, some folks might be because they don't want to drive in the dark, going home, uh, different different times of the year. But we're just trying to do that as an alternative. Um, it's a little bit uh, more of a smaller group, kind of spread out deal. So, uh, so anyhow, uh, just to let you know that we have that here on campus at 10:30. Um, but uh, tonight, I want to really kind of dig in on us and see where where we are in our. I, idolatry maybe um, there's a chance that that we have uh, possibly some idolatry that we need to deal with in our own personal lives or at least let God start working on and uh, so what I'm gonna do I'm gonna go ahead and pray then I'm gonna read um, read those verses of scripture then we're gonna dive in for a few thoughts so let's open in prayer father uh, what an awesome awesome time we have ahead of us tonight I believe as we get into your scripture. I want to thank you, God, for the truth of your word. I want to thank you, God, how you used uh, men inspired by you to write your word down, but you used them and their uh, what they were uh, going through as far as the context of their lives, um, how you used their um, even their character uh, in, in a lot of ways. But you did it in such a way that you gave us your, the very words that you would have us to have from you. That's mind-blowing, God, that you would do that. And even over such a long period of time to take all these different authors and to pull together one book that tells a consistent story. So, Lord, I thank you for your word tonight. And as we get ready to dive in, would you please... Uh, empower uh, our time uh, by your Holy Spirit in Christ's name, Amen. So Joshua twenty, I mean twenty four, verse thirteen, starting there. He says, "I have given you a land for which you did not labor, and cities which you did not build, and you dwell in them. You eat of the vineyards and olive groves which you did not plant. Now therefore, fear the Lord, serve Him in sincerity and in truth." And put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the river and in Egypt. Serve the Lord, he says. 
And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your, your, fathers, which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. For the people answered and said, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For the Lord our God is he who brought us and our fathers out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, who did those great signs in our sight and preserved us in all the way that we went and among all the people through whom we passed. Now, <clears throat> we, we know pretty much the context of what's going on here. This is after they are going into Canaan land. They have left Egypt. They've gone through the wilderness. They're entering into Canaan land. And God's reminding them there that it's, you know, don't forget, you are living in a land where you have done nothing to prepare it to this point. So they were given like a head start. There were already people there, and God removed the people from that land and gave it to his people that he promised it to. And so if you've ever received anything that was already prepared, you kind of get the gist of what, what that's like. There's a lot of difference between uh, somebody making you a cake and it's already all done versus you having to get the ingredients together and you baking the cake. And so God here is saying, I have taken care of all this. You're in the enemies. I have run out. I have given you this land. Don't forget, you're eating the fruit of this land and you didn't even plant these vineyards. You just walked into this. And he says, I'm the one that did this for you. <clears throat> then he says, and it's kind of kind of neat. For, he's like, so now you're here, what are you going to do? And this is what he says. Listen to verse 14 and 15 again. It says, Now therefore fear the Lord, serve him in sincerity and in truth, and put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the river and in Egypt. Serve the Lord. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, then choose for yourselves this day whom you're going to serve. And, and I'm just going to kind of stop right there for a moment. So God puts them on the spot. He says, all right, you're here. Now guess what? You need to make a choice. You need to, he said, I want you to serve me. And I want you to serve me with sincerity and in truth. He said, and don't serve the gods of your fathers. He said, but if you think it's a bad thing to serve me, he said, then, well, go on and serve either the gods of your fathers or the gods of the Amorites. And the Amorites is the ones that God ran out of the land. So I'm sure there were leftovers, even from the worship that the Amorites had been given to false gods, still left there in the land. It, it kind of tells us about that in other places in the Bible. But So nevertheless, <clears throat> you can either worship the same gods, little g gods, false gods, idols. You can worship them in the land uh, the, just like the Amorites did, or you can worship the gods that your fathers did, if you think it's a wrong thing to serve and worship me. No. So verse 14, let's kind of take it one little piece at a time and let's, let's just let's kind of dig into it. So now, therefore, he says, fear the Lord. First thing he tells them is that we are to, right off the bat, fear the Lord. Now you're in here, he says, now I want you, and, and I'm going I'm to use a, maybe a term like this, I want you to have reverential respect for me. Respect is something that's not really known that much in the world that we live in today, is it? I mean, a lot of people don't even respect their own parents. A lot of people don't respect their, their elders. They don't respect their, their employers. Something that always griped me so much uh, as an employee. And, and I, worked, I had my own business for six and a half years. And, and I can tell you right now, I think everybody ought to be in business for themselves at least one time because it will make you a better employee for somebody else because you will realize just how valuable an employee truly is. So, and, how, and, and, and also how much uh, an employer goes through. But, but I've seen so many times, and you've probably seen this too, somebody goes to work for somebody and they say, I want, I want you to work for me. And they say, how much are you going to pay me? And they agree on the pay and pretty much agree on a job assignment, but still, you know, things happen and somebody needs you to do something. 
you know let's just say that the toilet's overflowing and the boss man comes and says hey could you plunge that toilet for me man i ain't here to plunge no toilet right that ain't my job can you hear people saying that kind of stuff you don't pay me enough to plunge a toilet but yet you agreed to go to work for the man or you might say i'm tired of working for this much money but you're the one signed up for it you agreed to work for x amount of dollars going in it seems like there's this respect that's been possibly lost along the way we don't respect each other as much as we should but what about god if anybody as christians if anybody should be respected don't we think that he should be respected i mean there was a time a day and time uh, so i'm gonna pull some things from the past that are good things but in just a moment we'll i'm gonna turn around i'm gonna, I'm gonna gouge at you some for some things in the past too but there was a point in time i remember my my grandmother my dad's mom mama anytime there was a thunderstorm mama made you sit in the formal living room and you kept your mouth hushed she said god's working and you're gonna keep quiet I'm like what in the world this is crazy i mean and, and i we was talking earlier you know they'll go around unplugging stuff and you know and all this stuff and but you're gonna sit quiet during during this time now that might have seemed crazy but i can tell you one thing there was a reverential respect for the fact that the almighty was at work we we don't i don't think have as much of that respect anymore why is it that we don't i think there's a potential that in some ways we've drifted off but in but it could have been that maybe somewhere in there we've lost sight of who god truly is um i think as we've gone along in our walk as people in 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 our in the timeline of humanity we have more and more things that we have that can distract us away from from god we have more things to to that, that pull for our time our, our our the bidding of our time it's like uh there's plenty that you can do right as a matter of fact we are wore out and bored to death because we have done so much i mean to come up with something new nowadays is something else isn't it you know it's like oh i've, I've done this i've seen that and so people create there there are people in rooms everywhere around this world trying to create new things that would entice us okay so that we know that there's a lot more pulling for our time so i want you to think about this when you go it says now therefore fear the lord he says serve him now that word serve could mean could be translated worship uh to teal to labor you get the picture though it is to serve him as a matter of fact when god put adam in the garden he said adam i want you to tend and to keep the garden the word keep was more of a guard kind of thing but the word tend he literally wanted adam to tend the garden just like we would think about tending the garden to take care the cultivate is actually i think what the way word the word translates out so adam was to work the garden he says for you and i that we are to serve him that means that you and i are to put forth some type of action in our lives and i think it's blanket every single day of our lives we are to serve him how many of you have ever served anybody you ever brought somebody their supper lunch or anything like that or just uh, maybe somebody was sick and you waited on them you know and and, and it's in some ways it can be uh, it can be tough can't it because it's day in day out think about our healthcare workers right they go to work they serve people but honestly and truly all of us do if you work at, it doesn't matter if you work at arby's you work at caramont it doesn't matter you're serving you you would be serving somebody well, god says that you are to serve him he said i want you to serve me i want you to contribute to me then he gives some like a definition as to how this is going to work out adjectives he's descriptive words and so here he says worship him serve him labor for him in sincerity now that word sincerity when we look it up it means complete whole upright perfect entire as a matter of fact one of the words that is translated from that same word and used in the old testament is unblemished 
In other words, like the perfection of an unblemished sacrifice, a lamb without spot or blemish, you know, but whole, complete, entire. So he says we are to worship him, and we are to worship him in fullness, complete. Do you know that God, and we know these things, but I just want to try to bring them home a little bit more tonight, that God is not going to share his glory with anybody? Y'all with me? So God is a jealous God. Not that he's jealous in the sense that he needs us and our, our affection. Like we would be jealous over somebody looking in on our wives, guys, right? Our, our ladies, same way with your husbands and things. That's that. God is a jealous God in the sense that he is not going to share his glory with anybody. He does not need anybody else, but he wants all of the attention focused on him. You say, well, that is arrogant, is it not? You can call it what you want, but that's who our God is. Our God is zealous for us to worship him. Our God is zealous for us to serve him. Why wouldn't he be? If we're saved today, he gave us the gift of eternal life. He redeemed us. And he says that I want you to, to, to serve me in, in, in its entirety. In other words, all of your service goes to me. It's like, what is God talking about? Is he going to want me to quit my job? What does he want from me? We'll talk about that in just a minute. But I want you to think about this. Think of all the things in our lives that we have put forward as worship and service to God. Let's just do this. What does religion or church or any of that mean to you when you think about those things? And I want you to think along the lines of what God is contrasting this with. He says, I do not want you to do what your fathers did in the land of Egypt. And I don't want you to do what the Amorites were doing. See, I believe if we start making a, a list, categorizing things, we could put steeple on there, right? Because I can't find, and I, let me just throw this out there. Give me, uh, give me in your heart, you don't have to say them verbally, I'll walk through them, and I, I, I hope, I'm not perfect but I, at this, but I, I'll, I'll get a lot of them. But if I had to say, what is, what about church, or what about religion, or what about my security, and I think this is a big one you need to grab, what about my security? He says, fear me. You remember Sunday morning, he said in Isaiah 41, 10, he said, fear not. Why? For I am the Lord. In other words, don't fear anything else because I am the Lord, your God. You, you with me? And here he's saying, I want you to focus your attention in on fearing me. And we think about religion, we think about things that bring us security. A lot of times in people's lives, a particular song brings security to them. You with me? You can think of a song that gives you the, the Holy Ghost goosebumps or brings you to tears or bring, brings this warm feeling in your heart that this thing, this brings comfort to me. Walking into a church that's got stained glass windows brings comfort to some people. Walking into a church that has a steeple on top of it brings comfort to some people. Pews brings comfort to some people. But you know, that's picking on some things that are possibly of the past for a lot of people. It can happen to anybody. Because see what he's talking about here. He says, I do not want you to get locked into tradition. And anything that is, looks new today can become tradition very quickly. I'll promise you that what was contemporary five years ago, those people, if they're not careful, and it could be us. I just want you to hear my heart. If we lock into a pattern and the pattern becomes what we worship, then it is going to be hard to get out of that pattern. There are people we call it contemporary worship. If you ever try to pull some of them out of the pattern of worship that they're in, out of the situation, maybe the building, maybe the light show, maybe, maybe any of that stuff, I, I, I say this sometimes. Some people, follow, some people worship a hip pastor because of the way he dresses and cuts his hair but he's not going to be young forever. You with me? What's going to happen? But yet if you worship any pastor in general, guess what? He will also grow old. He could possibly get a disease, and anything could happen. 
And so what brings us comfort? You know, what, what is the thing that brings us that satisfaction? Because if we're not careful, I joked about this, the early service that we have, now that we've patterned into that for a while, if you tried to pull that away from somebody, oh my gosh. Y'all know you're out there, right? You know, I've even kind of polled a few people. It's like, hey, would you ever go back to 11 o'clock? Not, not on your life. Don't you dare. Don't you dare. Do you see how easy it is for us to get in a pattern and for the pattern to become something that becomes comfortable for us? See, God is saying that we are to serve Him. There's nothing in this book about hymns. Did you know that there was a time when the hymn book was not allowed in the church? You really need to, you really need to read the history of hymns. In the 1800s, there was a battle to get hymns in the church, especially a hymn book. Then you have, you come a couple, not quite 200 years later, there's a battle because somebody wants to take the hymns books out of the church. Not the hymns necessarily, but the books out. But can you imagine that? Did you know there was a time? Now, you've got to think now. Watch, watch the progression of things. You've got the people in the Old Testament, the, the Israelites, and you read in the, in the Old Testament, and you'll find that they praised the Lord, and they sang songs on the, on the harp and the lyre and the psaltery, and, and, and if you really go in and go, go look up and see what traditional Jewish music would look like, Hebrew music, there's drums and guitars and tambourines and all flutes and all kind of stuff, right? But why is it that we get over into, uh, uh, say, uh, uh, a thousand to two thousand years later and we progressively worked our way into the only thing that they would, at one time they wouldn't allow any instruments in the church. Then it's like, the organ a piano and an organ but don't you dare bring no drums in don't you dare bring this in or that but do you see what I'm saying and you know what none of that's in here as a matter of fact God says to worship him in the beauty of holiness he didn't say worship me with a pipe organ he didn't say worship me with a piano or a guitar or with drum. He said, worship me in the beauty of holiness and see how God pulls the direction of our lives back toward Him. He said, I don't want any of this stuff to be your focus. I want it, the entirety of your focus to be on me, He says. I've said this and I'll say it again. It's not original to me. I'm just repeating it. The greatest problem, I believe, one of the greatest problems we have in the church today is that we do not know who God is. I heard R.C. Sproul say that so many times. We do not know who God is. Everything's so superficial. You know, if the hardest thing you have to do and I have to do to have comfort in our day as, as a worshiper that comes into God's house is to go pick out an outfit. Because I'm going to be honest with you, for some people, that is the hardest thing that they do during the week for God, in their eyes for God, is to go pick out a tie that's going to go with a suit or pick out a dress to wear or something, whether it be a hat or whatever it is. If getting to church on Sunday morning is the greatest task that you accomplish for the Lord, is that actually serving him? Let I me mean, think about it. this. Is listen to what he says. He says, "I want you." He said, "Now, therefore, fear the Lord, serve Him in sincerity." Now, now, that word "sincerity" in and of itself, just the way that it's translated in in the in my Bible, uh, is it is sincere? How many of you would want somebody to love you? If you're in a relationship with them, to be sincere in their love. Honest. Pure. Right? How many of y'all would just honestly just want somebody to be honest and true and pure? You know, if you are my, I mean, if you are my man, you know, you, and I say man, you, you're, you're, you're my dog. You know, you're, you're my main dude as far as a friend goes. You're my, you're my running buddy. 
then I don't want you running with nobody else. You're supposed to be loyal to, to us. Ladies, you don't want your husband running with other people, whether it be a man or a woman. You want him to be loyal to you first, right? It's not, honey, it ain't that you can't have some friends, but your loyalty's got to be to me first. <laughs> I was in a church close to 10 years ago. I'm not going to name the church. I've told this story before. It's just been a little while. I had preached a community Thanksgiving service there. And a lady in that church come up to me right after the service was over with, and she said, have you seen our windows? And I'm standing in the middle of the sanctuary. I mean, I have to watch myself for sarcastic comments, you know? Like, there's windows right there. Like, I, I, I honestly and truly, I just, I'm sure I saw them, but I just did not. I was more, my mind was really more going to the fact that I was preaching from a little parapet thing that was on the side of the church instead of standing in the middle. It was driving me crazy. I was sitting there going, you got to move it to the middle. You got to move it to the middle because it's not going to be, it's going to be weird standing over here. That's what was going through my mind when I walked into church. She said, have you seen our windows? And I, this is honestly what I said. I, I said, I really have not paid that much attention, but yeah, okay, cool. I see, yeah. She said, our windows are our glory. That is a profession out of the mouth of somebody that is in a service during the weekday, on, the, on a weekday at 11 o'clock, and she is excited. She is a church member, and she is so excited. I just got through preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, and all that was on her heart was to come and tell me our windows are our glory. And I'll never forget my response to her. I said, I can believe it. And I went and got, got me something to eat. That don't make me better than her. I want you to hear me. I got my things too. But think about that. You'll find it's true if you go to messing with people's religion, I promise you. And it don't matter where you're at. It really does not matter where you're at. You could go to one of the most contemporary, progressive churches that you want to go to, and you pull the plug on the thing that they worship the most about church, and, and if, if there's that thing in there, whether it be a, 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 the, the whole LED wall, whether it be certain things in the music, whether it be to put the preacher out there in a different outfit than he would normally wear, whatever it might be, turn the lights on. Turn the lights up and say, hey, you going to read your Bible with me? And you watch what happens. The same thing that happened to Stephen in the book of Acts will end up happening to you. How do I know? I have lived through the gnashing of teeth. I have lived through the stonings and the whippings. I promise you. Because the day that you, and let me just say this, and this ain't nothing, I'm not trying to make this about me. I really am not. I can just share, share with you my experience. There have been many, many people that have left here. And I will promise you this. The majority of them left because I attacked their God. And it wasn't the God of the Bible. I'll never forget. I love telling testimonies of people who I know have actually served the Lord and looked in and just like they let God work on them. I remember preaching something similar to this several years back, good many years back. When, we, when you walked in the front door of the church, to the right there was a plaque hanging on the wall for Mr. McLemore, giving some money for something. I can't remember what it was for. That's Dewey's daddy. Didn't get the privilege to know him. I, I knew Miss McLemore, and all precious lady, from everything I've ever heard, his daddy, great dude. So Dewey comes to me after I get through preaching. 
and he says, you know, I thought about this thing. Because one of the comments I made, I said, we always want to put plaques on the wall in memory of people. Y'all know what I'm talking about, right? In honor of this person, in memory of this person, all this stuff. I made the comment. I said, if you know them so well and you think that they are a servant of the Most High God that just wants the glory of God, would they want, would they, if they were living, would they actually let you put that on the wall in honor of them? And he come to me and he said, you know, I thought about that thing a little bit. He said, my daddy was not a showy person. He said, he... You, to, you would have had to drug him up on the platform to put him in front of people. He didn't want to be in front of people. He didn't want to be on, on, on display. He said, the more I thought about that, he would never want his name hung up on the wall in God's house. He said, that's not what my daddy would have wanted. He said, so if you want, don't mind, the next time you get a chance, take it down to, and drop it by Mama's house. He said, we'll put it up in Mama's house because I think that's a little bit more of a fitting of a place to honor him there. You hear that? And I just go back to when I first got here. The pictures of the preachers in the foyer. And I know everybody's got their arguments on this stuff, but it ain't your picture, right? It was the picture of somebody else. And they were put up there after they died. And I thought about Mr. Pruitt. I was like, you know what? Mitchell Pruitt wouldn't want his picture on display like he was something big. Last time I checked, he all his testimony about it was he was just a quiet little humble man. Right? But for me, every time I walked in the door, I felt like I was disgracing God. This is his place. He owns this place. And I got to thinking about, I'm supposed to be decreasing. I'm supposed to let, and I get the fact that the testimony could come through. The, I get all that. Like I say, you can say it's right or wrong or whatever. It wasn't your picture hanging in the hallway. But do you get what I'm saying? What are we doing and why are we doing it? And when you think about things that can buy for your attention, little g gods. You know, I, I remember the story, and so many people have heard this story, of the woman, the, you know, grandma, uh, and then the daughter's cooking, and I mean the granddaughter, let's see, yeah, daughter and granddaughter's cooking, and on the granddaughter's cutting the end off the ham, right? And mama and grandmama's in there, you know, in the kitchen, and it's like, I'm just curious, why do we cut the end off the ham? And Grandma speaks up and says, oh, that's because the pot I used to use, the ham wouldn't fit in it. And they thought it was some magical secret to make the ham taste good. Listen, listen to the text again. He says, now, therefore, fear the Lord, serve him in sincerity and in truth, and we'll deal with that in just a second. And put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the river and in Egypt. And he says, serve the Lord. Now let's think about the, let's go into that context. Get out of our context for a moment. Get into that context. I remember Moses, reading about Moses taking the children of Israel out of Egypt. They get across the Red Sea. The first thing that they come in contact with that is a hindrance they said, I wish you would have left us in Egypt because at least we had graves there. Vance Havner said they preferred the garlic of Egypt over the, gl gl or the, let's see, the glory of Canaan or either the honey of Canaan. I think it was the glory of Canaan now that I, he was alliterating it. They preferred the garlic, the food of Egypt over the glory of Canaan land. Do you realize that they were slaves in Canaan land? I mean, in uh, Egypt. Listen, they were slaves. They, were, they had taskmasters, most likely with whips. They didn't get to eat the food that the Egyptians got to eat. 
they had to eat their own type of food. They, didn't, they weren't getting treated better than the people that they were working for. You with me? They weren't even getting treated as good as. And they said, we want to go back. You know why they wanted to go back? Because there was comfort there. They were in bondage, but they were so out of their comfort zone. And why were they out of their comfort zone? I mean, God's with them, right? Think about this. God's with them. What more would you want than the creator and sustainer of the universe that can speak a word and mountains are moved, that can, and he does, brings water from a rock. And when we think about bringing water from a rock, we have a misconception about what happened there. When we think about Moses striking the rock and water coming out, we think of this little stream like a little, like a little spring coming out, don't we? That's what comes to my mind. Do you realize how many people had to get water? Millions of people had to get water. When I believe when God had Moses strike that rock and the water come out, there was a rushing river that come out of that thing to provide the water. They were without food in the wilderness. And what does God do? God starts dropping manna from heaven, literally translated out sweet bread. I'm thinking of yeast rolls from Texas Roadhouse. Can I get a witness? I mean, he just starts dropping out this honey bread from heaven. And the people get so much of it, they're sick of it. Well, I say they're sick of that. Then they said, we want some meat, man. This bread all the time is just... And so he sends quail. And he gives them so much that they're gorged. They're just overrun with being full of what God's given them. But they'd rather go back to Egypt. Why? Because in the wilderness, I can't provide anything for myself. The Egyptians can't provide for me. Who's going to provide for me? It's going to have to be God. And if you and I go out here and serve the Lord, worship the Lord every day throughout our day, if we go to work, it's not us providing what we have. It's not our employers providing what we have. God's always the one providing what we have. It's always, did you know that God made the Egyptians just like he made the Israelites? They were a pawn in his hand. And I mean, you watch through the Old Testament, you watch whenever there were people oppressing God's people and God's people would look to the Lord, God would move upon their enemies and he would reward his people from the prosperity of their enemies. In other words, everything they had in Egypt, God was providing that too. And God was in control. They wanted to be set free, wanted to be set free. But I think too often we want to be set free, but on our own terms. You know, I want out of this bondage that I'm in. I want out of this situation that I'm in. I want out of the... Uh, the, the the I just want to be free. And God says, in essence, in order to be free, you surrender to me. And there's a lot of people, young people and old people, and everybody in between, that there's no peace, no no joy. No, no comfort in our lives other than the comfort that we, we have. I'll pick on the young people for a moment. A set of earbuds or, or a video game or anything that you find comfort in that is your escape. You know, 
I don't like the, the place I live. I don't like the people I live under. You know, and you find refuge in something other than God. He said, but I've tried this God thing. I'll promise you this. If you wholeheartedly, truthfully, studied this book, and you have given your life to the, to the author of this book, and he fails you, come tell me. I want to hear about it. Because this book, nothing in this book says that the circumstances of life are going to get easy. That's a lie. That is not in the context of who God is. God did not see Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego around the fire. He got in the fire with them. He didn't take Daniel out of the lion's den. He got in the lion's den with Daniel and the lions. He did not take them over the Red Sea or around the Red Sea. He took them through the Red Sea. They did not go in a hovercraft across the, uh, the wilderness, the, the desert. They went through the desert. In every circumstance that we face, that does not mean that God sometimes will not rescue us out of a perilous situation, but it does not. I'm, I'm just going to tell you, the majority of the time, what is God going to do? God is going to walk with us through, through what we're going through. He is going to take us through. He said, I want you to get in the boat and let us go to the other side. The disciples are in the storm. The storm is raging. But who's in the boat? Jesus is there in the boat with them. And they go to panicking because everything that they know about floating on that water is in trouble. They, they've lost control because the storm has overcome their abilities and the boat's abilities. And they wake him up. Lord, don't you care that we're perishing? He gets up. He calms the sea. And he turns around. And he looks at them and he says, Oh, you of little faith. And I just wonder sometimes. Us. And see... It's, we're bad about following generational stuff, are we not? Generational curses are not fictitious. Now, my God's a chain breaker. My God is a curse stopper. When people humble themselves and turn from their wicked ways, and that's the first place we got to get to is acknowledging the fact that this is not pleasing to my big G God. This is not pleasing to him. It is sin. I must repent of it. And very few people want to talk about the fact of the things that they've been doing wrong, but yet it's their coping mechanisms that those is sin. God's greatest work's done in here. That's where God's greatest work is done in, inside of us. I mean, sometimes I want to use words that I can't use from up here. And I'm thankful that God's growing me to where I don't use them as much as I used to. Hopefully none. So you just take it and read through the lines. But life stinks. Right? There ought to be some amens going up everywhere. Life stinks. The, the, the people will lie to you. Amen? Yeah, people will lie to you. People will take advantage of you. And, and I, I'm, I'm just sharing this with some of our younger folks. If you don't know it yet, get ready because it's coming. People will lie to you. Sometimes your own family will lie to you. They will take advantage of you. People will break your heart. People will steal from you. They will take. Family members will take from you. If you're a grandparent and your grandchild is a teenager or any age older than that and they don't have anywhere to live and they don't have a job, if you let them stay with you, you better lock your belongings up. My daddy told me one time, he said, a man don't work, a steal. I said, don't work. A man that won't work, some people can't because of physical situations. But but listen, those things happen. 
People will make promises to you, long-term promises, and they will fall down on it. The weather will let you down. Amen? You can plan all you want to, but you are not God. You do not, the weatherman does not know what the weather's going to be like tomorrow. He's taking an educated guess. It seems to get worse and worse every, every year. Sometimes your best laid plans will let you down. You can plan and plan and plan. Nobody that is in health care right now ever dreamed that they would face the situations that they're facing at this moment. I mean, they went through all these years of schooling, and they never thought that. But then, there are plenty of people that their marriage didn't turn out like it they had hoped. As a matter of fact, a lot of y'all just women, just be honest with me, honest for a moment. You can say whatever you want to, them, but a lot of times, there's something on your wedding day that lets you down. Because you have built this thing up in your mind, right? Right? <laughs> you make all the plans you want to and all those things. But see, God's saying, I don't want you to trust in these things. And here's the idea of it is, is that we're worshiping those things. I don't ever think about it that way, but we are worshiping those things. That we, we uh, let me ask you, put it this way. If I took the thing that you spend the most time or the most energy or the most thought life in, you have the most investment emotionally, spiritually. If I took that away from you, would I have taken God away from you or would I have taken something else away from you? Because I can tell you right now, one of the things that I struggle with personally, and God is bringing this to my mind, is that I worship my wife sometimes more than I worship God. And I know there's some people with their hearts breaking right now because of children that have been in wrecks. Not just here in my own hometown. One of the star young men, 27, 28 years old, was in a wreck. He's gone. Engaged to be married. And gone. Same thing here in town. But, and, 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 and some fighting for their life right now. And that's hard, isn't it? What? Listen, it's hard when you think about the fact that if you and I, if God was our sustenance, if God was, if we worshiped him in sincerity, that he was the, uh, let's put it this way. I know you can't take God out of your heart. I get that. And I know you can buy another Bible, but I want to use this illustration. If somebody broke into your house and they robbed you, would the first thing you go check on be your Bible or would it be family heirlooms and pictures and all those things? Because I can tell you right now, I can buy some other Bibles, but I've honestly been thinking about taking some of my Bibles and putting them in fireproof safes. I really have. And, and I, this ain't nothing about me, I promise you. I am not some theologian. I am not some, I am not where I need to be with God. I promise you without a shadow of a doubt. I'm not trying to brag in front of you. But I love this book. And I've got one for each of my daughters. And the reason I have them is because I want them to know that Dad cared about this book, cared about what was in it. And I'll promise you this, that would be one of the first things that if something was to happen to my house, that'd be one of the first places I'd go to make sure that those books 
I've got time invested in them. When a page tears in it, it breaks my heart that I accidentally, I keep these little post-it notes all over my, and sometimes I'll reach and grab them the wrong way and it'll start tearing a page and it, it tears my heart out. And I'm not nowhere near what I should be as a student of God's Word, but I'm trying to tell you that whatever you worship the most, that is your God. That's your God. And you can worship serving and not be where you need to be. In other words, I just do things. I want to do for people. I want to do for people. But huh, do you know that just doing things for people, good things, might be idolatry? It might be idolatry to do that. Because one of the biggest questions is, is that what God wants you to do? So even in our work life, we're to serve Him. Serve the Lord with gladness. And where do we do that? In everything that we do, we are to do everything as unto the Lord. We are to love our spouses as if we're doing it for God. We are to work for our employers as if we're doing it for God. We are to love our fathers and our mothers. We are to uh, uh, honor them as if we're doing it unto God. I caught a young man back talking to his mama a couple years ago. And I said, why are you doing that? And he didn't know what, how to answer. I said, you're a Christian? Yeah. I said, is God pleased with you breaking his law? I said, because your mama don't owe you no explanation as to why she told you what to do. There's nothing in the Bible that says you're supposed to be able to question her about this. Unless she's telling you to, you know, to turn away from God. I said, is she doing that? I don't think she is because I know her. No. I said, so God's displeased with you right now. And if I could give you some words from the Lord, shut up. I said, I don't want to hear you back talk your mama. Not on, this ain't my kid. But this is a young man that's old enough at that point, and he professes to be a Christian. And I said, so if you profess to be a Christian, I said, and here's your mom. Ain't you supposed to honor her? The reason that... You know, I mean, I'll even talk about Tim right now. Honestly and truly, Tim was grieving leaving here. If Tim could have stayed, had, had his choice, he would have moved to Kings Mountain and settled here and kept leading worship and being with us here. But he couldn't. Why? He's the only child, and mom and daddy needed him. And he packed his life up, and he went to Virginia. Now, on the other side of it, I hope he's watching because it, he, ain't, he ain't, like, got it hard. <laughs> Up there grading off a place to put a modular home, beautiful view of the mountain, so. <laughs> so anyhow. But nevertheless, nevertheless, God first in everything unless you think it's not right to serve him is that because that's what he says right listen to what he says and if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord then decide today who you're going to serve in other words if you don't think it's a good thing to serve the Lord if you think it's wrong to serve God can I just give it to you like this? Then do the church of the Lord Jesus Christ a favor and find something else to do. People beat up on the church so often because they say they see hypocrisy. I heard of a church. I don't know this to be true. 
I heard of a church that was very has been very legalistic. And whether it's true or not, it's a good illustration. But very critical about the people that attend there. You got to dress the right way. You got to do this. You got to do that. Don't do this. Don't do that. And all that kind of stuff. Until somebody in leadership in the church, their son ended up slipping. And they're actually letting that person supposedly keep do, doing something in the church, like serving. And a lot of people left, supposedly, because of the hypocrisy there. But it's almost like you got what you asked for, in a way. That's why God wants us wants us to not we're not perfect never never did he ever say that never did he ever say that we had to be but he but he also said that we are to strive be ye holy for i am holy that we are to strive for holiness that we are to pursue holiness without which no one will see the lord we are to strive for holiness we are to push for holiness we our desire should be to serve our king and he says that he wants us to serve him in completeness sincerity i would just go so, so far to say this i believe if we do have a desire to have no other gods before him that our worship would be different that when we run into a situation through the day with our employer or our spouses or whatever that we would not be so focused on them because we know what people will what they will let you down but my spouse is not supposed to let me down my employer is not supposed to let me down or give me a break, right? I'm, on, I'm not far into this thing, but in the, in the time that Christy and I have been married, we've been through a lot of phases. Can I get a witness? And we're ever-changing. She was joking around with me. She said, you didn't know you was married in this part, did you? <laughs> you know? <laughs> and guess what? We'll get another 10 years down the road. We'll probably be a little different. Amen? Better or worse, sickness than health. Richer or poor, till death do us part. I just wish I would have been able to see all that, preacher. If you'd have been able to see all that, would you still marry him? Anyhow. But when people do let you down, first off, the letdown is so different because you already know that you are not expecting them to fulfill your life. Your employer, and this is hard to grab, but your employer is not your source of resources. You with me? How many of y'all been been through a, a plant closing? Anybody? Come on, any? Come on, anybody? I know there's some mill workers in here. Got to be cotton mills and everything else. No, right? You're still here. And it don't make no difference if the stock market falls on its face. God did not promise you that the stock market would always be in place. What he promised you was that he'd never leave you nor forsake you. I'm going to close this in prayer. And then after we uh, give it a minute, uh, go offline, I wanna, we're going to have a quick time of prayer. So uh, let, let's pray. Father. You're so good to us, God. I thank you for your grace. Teach us, oh God. Teach us. Teach us to love you. Thank you for your forbearance, God. 
what would our lives be like if we absolutely wholly fully completely sincerely served you with all of our heart mind soul and strength God as we think about those things and, and they come to our mind would you give us the nudge the urge to repent the Holy Spirit of God speak to our hearts and let us repent transform us in Christ's name amen